one's not here. So first you receive the comprehensive exam questions, three of them. You have six weeks to do whatever research and preparation you wanna do. But then after six weeks, you will receive an email that tells you which of the three you will be answering. And then you have 10 days to answer that question. And so uh, all of those are randomly selected. So as I said, we tried to select questions that are sort of you know, within the areas that we know might be of interest to you, but which specifically three is a chance. And then it, my understanding is that the one out of three will also be randomly selected. And so in theory, you can spend those almost two months of preparation and write all three. And then on the day when you know which one needs to be uh, you know, written up, you just clean it up and submit. Uh, I don't think anyone will do it, but in theory, you can get it all done in those whatever, almost two months, but then you have another 10 days to sort of do the clean up and the final write up. My, my you know, speculation here or, or expectation, if you are anything like me, you probably will do a little research here and there during those six weeks. And then you'll take the whole 10 days and you will work on this and only on this, which is a viable strategy, so it makes perfect sense. But in theory, you can do it all you know, in advance, whatever you know, is allowed. But yes, because it, it gives you relatively a lot of time, you don't have that uh, you know, luxury of uh, taking them, uh, you know, changing the dates. And so the logic was also that since the students knew the date like half a year in advance, the dates, they presumably had enough opportunities to make arrangements at work uh, and not plan any vacation for those dates and things like that. So, so that's briefly about that. But yeah, hopefully uh, the questions I sent you from the comms, maybe some of them will be suitable for your research, but I'm sure you'll have more ideas of your own. And I spoke on the phone, I think with three of you. And so all three had good questions. And in fact, even you know, one person had you know, more than needed questions. So in fact, the challenge becomes which ones we will select because there are several good questions. So, um, yeah. But anyway, uh, it seems like everybody who needed to be here is here. It's um, uh, a late hour. So let's start um, about today's topic. So the plan for today is to talk about probably the most fundamental question in international business uh, or fundamental building block in research on international business, and that is culture. And so we will talk today about culture and its derivatives. So for the topic, I wrote culture plus. So that includes culture, cultural distance, uh, acculturation, and cultural intelligence. So they sort of you know, extend or kind of stem one from another. And uh, you do have a list of readings, which I suspect you didn't read, but I'm curious. So if I ask you how many of you have looked at those articles, anyone, at least one hand? Uh, oh, actually, so have you actually read some of those articles or you just had a quick look at the list? Okay, if you I've read some of them, but not all of them. Okay, well, that's actually better than I expected. I mean, ideally, I want you, I mean, the perfect scenario wouldn't be been you said, you would have said, we read all of the articles, we watched the recording of the last semester's lecture, and now we have a few questions. Everything's clear, but I have a few clarifying questions. How about that on page 25 of that paper? You know, he says this, this, and this. I'm not entirely sure if I fully understand. Can you clarify that? But yeah, no problem. So I don't expect you to read them in advance. But so what I'll do here, instead of sort of reviewing each article in detail, I will give you sort of a survey of the field. So I will tell you what are the key features, key challenges, key developments, key points, so that if in, at any point in your future, you need to uh, include culture, acculturation, cultural distance, or cultural intelligence to your study as one of your variables. You sort of know the basic concepts, and then you can easily go back to those readings and then read more and figure out what's, you know, what's needed. I suspect most of you will need to use culture as one of your variables. At least the three students I talked to, all three plan to use culture. In one of the discussions, the issue of individualism, collectivism, for example, came up. And so it's not as simple. And so in the conversation, I deliberately didn't uh, deliberately didn't talk about that. So I said, well, you know, let's let's keep it at the individualism collectivism for now. But in the readings, you will see why it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so I'll talk a little bit about the key issues, and then you can read the full articles if you want to learn more or when you need to learn more. Um, so um, yes, and no problem. Somebody says no camera, no problem at all. Now, so let me share the readings and I'll go paper by paper. And so there are no slides intentionally. So um, because it's easier to show the actual paper 
Likewise, um, I will be switching between different uh, papers, different um, uh, documents. So this way we will be able to sort of to look at the actual stuff. So um, yeah, pollinations, that was the last one. By the way, any comments related to the uh, last topics, like last lecture, uh, when we talked about uh, what is ID, what is theory, uh, the publishing game a little bit about, uh, a, a little bit about the research replicability and problems. Any comments or um, questions related to that? Okay, well, let's go directly then to, directly to um, culture. And uh, so I'll skip this. So here we are at culture. So, Several papers that I would like you to pay uh, sort of special extra careful attention to. And again, sorry that some of these papers are mine. In fact, uh, in full disclosure, even now, right before this lecture, I'm working on yet another paper that I will be presenting tomorrow at the Academy of International Business, specifically on culture. And then hopefully we'll submit, um, updating uh, the paper now and hopefully we'll submit in a few days. But this one is specifically on measurement of culture. But I actually would like to start with this question. <clears throat> so. You all know what culture is, right? Can you define culture? Can anyone define culture? Can you tell me what culture is? Oh, don't so be this, Come on. Yes, Erica? Um, the set of values, practices, and artifacts that are formed and retained over time within a group. Yeah, that's actually a very, very good definition. So very, very good definition. Um, uh, as, as early as 1964, there was this guy, um, the last name was Klotchhorn. And so he, at that time, identified 62 definitions of culture and wrote a paper that reviewed those definitions. By now, you can probably find hundreds of definitions. But just like Erica said, um, so I have to provide definitions of culture in just about every of my paper. And so usually I say that there are several sort of attributes. One, as Erica very correctly pointed out, it's a multifaceted, maybe even multi-level construct. So it includes values, practices, um, artifacts. So the way we talk, the way we treat each other, the way we create art, so the way you know the food we eat, all of those are elements of culture. Second, by definition, it's something shared. So not everything that is values um, is cultural and not everything that is, uh, you know, for example, artifacts, uh, artifacts of culture. So it's something that is shared. And so likewise, personality, you know, we may have certain personalities, but these are different from cultural values. So these are, you know, um, uh, individual things, whereas culture is a shared one. And I'll get back to why there is a problem with these definitions here. So, but I have a more important question for you then. So, all right, well, let's say we know what culture is. Uh, although again, it's one of those uh, terms that are ubiquitous and at the same time, you know, sort of understandable by everyone, but, you know, hardly anyone can, can, you know, say something specific about it. Like, for example, in one of my papers, I remember I started by saying that when you Google culture, you get, at that time, it was about 4 billion hits. And it's literally more than when you, for example, Google sex or um, money or politics or whatever else I tried. So it's extremely, extremely pervasive. But at the same time, so if I wanted you to, to, or ask you to describe a culture, or better yet, to describe it with numbers. You know, as Lord Kelvin said once, not once, like hundreds of years ago, if you cannot measure something with numbers, then your knowledge of the subject if is of superficial kind, I believe, he said. And then only when you can express it and describe it with numbers, then your knowledge becomes deeper or something like that. And so if I asked you to, for example, describe, let's say, the American culture with numbers, how would you do it? Or if I wanted, or if I asked you to compare, let's say, an American the American culture to, I don't know, whatever other country you want, a German culture, for example, or Japanese culture, would you be able to describe it with numbers? Not just say that, well, Americans like, I don't know, hot dogs and Japanese like sushi. So uh, would you, how would you describe that with numbers? It's a million dollar question. And maybe even more than a million dollar question, because I think Hofstede, about whom we will be talking today, uh, the royalties for his books that describe how to answer this question, I'm pretty sure it's, it's been more than a million dollars, you know, over the de decades. So how would you measure it? Imagine it's 19, 1979 and nobody knows how to do it yet. So the, the, the book didn't come out. So how would you do it? Teresa, do you think- I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking, 
I, um, it's not quite a number, but if I was back in the 70s, I think I would maybe go down the dimensions end and say, okay, well, what are the dimensions that I'm looking at? Is it personality, um, identity? And then I would probably come up with uh, a fancy weighted average of saying, okay, these things make up personality and sort of create an overall scale for different dimensions of culture. But I, and I see all of the different dimensions that have been created over the years that make it even more challenging. Well, do you know at least one dimension or can you name one of them that, that has been popular? Like for example, individualism collectivism came up in today's conversation. How would you make, again, definitions. I mean, yeah. in fact, in one of my papers, I advocate that we ban the term individualism collectivism, never use it again for the reason that people lump under this umbrella anything and everything. Like if you look at the literature on individualism, collectivism, people kind of, you know, jam into this definition, um, my interest versus my group interest, uh, work versus life or work-life balance, family versus work, uh, preference to work alone versus preference to work in teams. I mean, just about anything and everything and those things are not necessarily correlated. I mean, I may prefer to work in teams but I may value my own interests over interests of the society in, in which I live and things like that. But let's imagine that somehow we all agree on what individualism collectivism is. So how would you measure that dimension? Like, where, would you, where do you think the United States ranks? But more importantly, can you express that in numbers compared to other cultures? Like on a 100 point scale, for example, how would you place one country or one society on the scale versus another? I think I would measure autonomous or autonomy, degree of in, independence, and then collectively. No, no, but, but uh, actually, right, autonomy, but how would you measure it? So I'm not asking what measure, I'm asking about the methodology, that the approach. Like you wouldn't take, oh, a ruler, right? You wouldn't take a, you know, like, I don't know, some sort of a scale from your bathroom and you wouldn't put two countries on the scale to see what were they, you know, how heavy they are. Like what would be the instrument? Right. So, well, that's interesting because I read forward into the methods and, and, you know, we're also used to going into the surveys around self-reporting around, well, hey, do you prefer to be in this team? And um, I, maybe in this case, um, it's more observation to see teams, you know, like individualistic, individual culture. Do, do people tend to go in teams and then come back or do they tend to say, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to run. So I would say I, it would probably have to be a combination of observing and maybe some kind of self-reporting to validate that. Okay, that, that's a thought. So, um, all right, any other thoughts? <laughs> I didn't get you a number yet, I don't know. <laughs> One of the things that we do with our seniors is have them fill out a values and action assessment um, as part of the, the leadership training that, that we give them. And the way we put numbers behind it is we ask them all, and, and the values and action assessment, I, I really thought about that a lot as I was reading all of these articles on culture. It's taking 24 characteristics that are supposed to be universal mm -hmm. and getting you to fill out a survey. And based on how you, you know, fill out a survey with some of the same questions that were in the method sections on some of these articles, um, it would rank those 24 values for each individual. So they all had all 24, but your ranking would differ. And so, so then how- is that there would be a list of some sort of questions that ask about our preferences or values or describe us. And then we would be asked to either express some sort of agreement or disagreement with those statements or answer those questions, right? Exactly. And then you would take the average of those answers in, in a way, right? For, for, for each and, and give a rating because you're because, taking right. each one of those answers and putting yeah. it under right. one of those 24 characteristics. And, and what I've seen having done this through you know several semesters now is that you know we're going from one generation to the next and and it's all within ECU so it'll be interesting to see yeah. you know once I can get the numbers back as we come out of COVID how that differs but the the culture and what each class you know ranks differently um, online versus face to face you've got cultural components within that but I can put numbers behind it to show it. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's very good. So what I will be talking about now is um, how exactly it's done in a little bit you know, more detail. But the paper I'm working on now, as you can see, it's called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And so it's not in, on your readings quite yet, but I will literally talk about the good first, and then the bad, and then the ugly. 
And believe me, it's an ugly business. It's like, you know, hot dogs, you know, that expression, you don't want to know what happened to your hot dog before it got on your plate, precisely the same thing. Uh, so most people love those cultural indices that come from Hofstede's uh, sort of uh, work. And if you haven't seen it yet, uh, uh, you know, literally the outcome of his work was a list of 40 countries originally, and I think eventually it was expanded to 52. And you would see a list of countries, a list of dimensions, and again, the original list of dimensions in Hofstede's work was individualism, collectivism, self-explanatory, power distance. So in some cultures, people sort of see bosses as semi-gods and in other cultures, your boss is just a guy who happens to make more money, but not better, or you don't necessarily revere them with any you know, degree of, you know, just a guy who makes more money and maybe you know, has the right to, to give you orders, but you don't really you know, see a lot of power distance between the two of you. Uh, uncertainty avoidance, again, presumably in some cultures, people prefer to have clear rules and guidance how things should be done. And in other cultures, people are much more comfortable with the absence of such rules or guidance or, or norms. And finally, kind of a confusing name, masculinity, femininity. So um, it, it had nothing to do originally with the gender, like men and women. But the idea was that in uh, some cultures, masculine values are valued. And that is uh, achievement orientation in a winning important, you know, how important it is to win, how important it is to have a lot of money. And in other cultures, feminine values are valued, uh, which is, you know, like more harmony, peace, and things like that. Uh, later, there was some confusion because Hofstede started talking about also gender roles, saying that in masculine cultures, men and women have different roles and in feminine cultures, men and women are treated equally. But again, uh, we'll get to why that is problematic a little bit later based on his instrument. And so the result was a list of countries and uh, a score from zero to 100 for each country on that scale. And so everybody loved it because you know, whatever you do, like for example, one of you wants to see if people you know, uh, behave differently in different cultures and you believe that the difference would be due to culture. So all you do is just get a few samples of people from different countries, compare their behaviors, then look up in Hofstede's uh, book, the cultural indices for those countries. And let's say if you find that, for example, Americans behave differently from the Chinese, and you know that Americans are based on the scale 91 on individualism, so the most individualistic society, and China actually was not on the list, but let's say you take Ukraine, which is 54. So it's much more collectivist or closer to the middle. You can say, well, the difference must be because Americans are individualists and Ukrainians are collectivists, or at least somewhere in the middle. Now, the problem with that is that once you look under the hood, so kind of once you trace how those numbers, you know, appeared on that page, you will realize that there is a lot of bad and a lot of very ugly stuff there. And so I'll talk about some of those things now. So first, the questions. So Hofstede um, originally, so the father and, and, you know, probably the most cited, definitely the most cited uh, scientist in social sciences, but one of the probably most cited uh, overall uh, so with uh, literally thousands of citations. In fact, his Cultures Consequences, the original book has been cited more than 100,000 times. I mean, like it's a super, super class, classic, like very, very big influence. And in fact, in my papers, um, one of them reviews, we'll be talking about it, how culture has been measured over time. In fact, you know what? Let me go right away here. And so I'll be talking about some papers and I'll uh, take them one by one. So when we go to this paper here, so one of the papers assigned to you is called 50 years of measure or half a century of measuring culture. And so for this paper, we uh, looked at 121 instruments for quantifying culture. So at this time, the catalog contains, and I have it here, um, it contains a total of 130, 50, 147 instruments for measuring culture. But based on that analysis of 121, we found that 97% of all subsequent models and instruments uh, for measuring culture could be traced back to Hofstede. So pretty much all of them contained the same dimensions. And then more importantly, all of them used the same approach, which is a set of questions. You read them, you self-evaluate and self-report, which means all of them are potentially open to manipulation. I may provide answers that are sort of socially desirable and not what I really say. Like if you ask me how important is money to you? Well, I can say it's very important or I can say, well, yeah, money is not everything because I want you to like me and I don't want to admit that maybe money matters a lot to me. So Hofstede, despite the criticism, the truth is that just about every subsequent attempt to measure culture 
could be traced back to his original uh, work. Now, the problem here is that his original work was not intended to be a cultural assessment uh, study. Uh, the work was part of his contract with IBM, and he was hired to evaluate employee attitudes and employee satisfaction. And so the actual survey contained something like 100 questions, and they asked about anything and everything. Satisfaction with compensation, you know, all kinds of things. Satisfaction with coworkers, maybe preference for working hours and things like that. It was later that he looked at those instruments, I mean, at those items and he said or thought, well, there seems to be a systemic difference in how people, for example, from Ukraine, again, Ukraine was not part of the study at that time, um, but let's say Yugoslavia was one or Germany. He noticed that people from Germany, for example, answer questions systematically different than Americans. And he thought, oh, that must be cultural. So let's see if we can extract some cultural dimensions from that, um, uh, from that study. And so the original dimensions, as I said, there were four, and then the fifth one was added a little bit later. And then a sixth one was added a little bit later. And then other people came up with all kinds of other dimensions. And then as you can see, there are all kinds of other things. So people also measure things like emotional neutral, uh, people, you know, self-identity, self-perception, conformity, family integration. So there were all kinds of other dimensions. So, so some of them sort of correlate with Hofstadter's dimensions and others seem to be relatively unique. Now, the ugly part of that is, uh, you, you probably have heard many times that Americans are individualists, right? So you probably know that American, America is a very individualist society. And then can you give me examples of collectivist societies? Who would be a collectivist based on your understanding or intuition? China. China. Hmm? China. You would say China, for example. Well, yeah. the ugly part is that, first of all, China is not as collectivist as we think. So when people started comparing, they actually found that, for example, Japanese often score more individualist than Americans, for example. Second, let me actually show you the real questions that went into labeling Americans individualists and uh, uh, Chinese, for example, or whoever else collectivists. You would think that it's some sort of like deep, you know, fundamental study with a lot of questions. Sure. So these are the actual questions, for example, in the 82 version of the survey. So to change it a little bit, that like the only four questions that were used to, to, to essentially divide the world into individualist collectivists. So how important it is to you to live in an area that is desirable to you and your family? Okay, well, I can see how that's collectivist. But for example, how important it is for you to have good physical working conditions, such as good ventilation and lighting, adequate space, et cetera. I mean, is that really such a, you know, like based on face validity, like I would argue it's not a very good question. And by the way, it was dropped from the 94 survey version and then it was replaced with something else. It was replaced like with have security of employment or um, have, well, oh, no, it looks like good physical conditions still remains part of the question, right? Have an adventure, an element of adventure and variety on the job. I mean, this is really not that sophisticated. And I, as I said, I would even argue that some of these questions perhaps are not really, you know, suitable to measure something that we would define as individualism, collectivism. But yeah, the way it was done is uh, the questions were added up. And so in this particular case, it's funny that they were not even averaged, but they were weighted differently. So there were these constants and like here minus 29, or in this case, plus 130. And there were different weights. Like for example, this first item was uh, weighted as 27. The third item, like for example, have good work in physical conditions that was weighted as 76. Uh, that's actually something I never noticed before. So somehow, your preference for good working conditions was as like three times as important as your preference to live close to your family. So, I mean, obviously it was done to manipulate the score so that they fit within, um, uh, within one, zero to 100, but a theoretical range would have been something like this, right? And so, but then if you took the overall averages, you would have seen that actually there was not that much difference at all. So people were in general, not really that different from one another. Most people wanted some, you know, closeness to family. Most people, so basically on a five point scale, most people were choosing numbers between three and four. Like hardly anyone would say that it's critically important and hardly anyone would say it doesn't matter to me at all. And so only because of these mathematical manipulations, the scores were sort of blown up to range from zero to 100 and sometimes even beyond that range. And yeah, so that's basically how we measure culture. And then a bunch of other people came along and came up with their own instruments. And so some of them are, as you can see, longer, some of them are shorter, 
So in this catalog of mine, you can see a collection of uh, almost 150 instruments. So again, some of them would use a uh, liquor type scale, uh, one to five. Some of them would have some, you know, uh, like multiple choice options and, and so on and so on. But basically it was very similar to Hofstetter with the difference that because the original list of questions sometimes didn't even pass the face validity test. So people like, for example, Gorkman and Howell. So this one was specifically designed to, to address the limitations of Hofstetter's instrument. And so it contained more questions and they were specifically designed to actually be more relevant. Like group welfare is more important than individual rewards. Okay, that's consistent with the definition. Group, group success is more important than individual success. All right, well, at least with this one, we can, we can live. And so this became much, much more popular. Um, uh, not necessarily much more popular, but at least much more respected um, as a way to measure things. Then some other instruments uh, didn't like this masculinity femininity thing. So because, you know, uh, some people saw it as gender differences, you know, men versus women, but then others saw it as achievement versus harmony. So as you can see here in Dorfman and Howell, they specifically looked at it as gender roles. In Hofstede's original instrument, as you will see, it has actually, actually nothing to do with the gender roles, but instead it deals with um, achievement. So if we go to masculinity, femininity, um, where is it? Concerned avoidance, uh, long-term, short-term, did I skip it? Power distance, uh, yes. Uh, so how important it is for you to work with people who cooperate with one another, uh, have an opportunity to advance, uh, for advancement in your career. Uh, so most people can be trusted. So this is a little bit more about, you know, uh, sort of achievement, importance of achievement versus maybe, you know, harmony in a group. And so, although again, it's kind of strange that even though the items all deal with issues like, like this, in the definition, Hofstede did mention gender roles and did speculate that men are different in, you know, from women in some societies versus others, even though not a single question asked anything about men versus women in the survey. So um, in your readings, you have several things that in that respect, I recommend that you take a look at. So you have this catalog of cultural value, I mean, of uh, instruments for measuring cultural values. And then you have this uh, paper that describes, essentially analyzes the paper, I mean, the instruments that measure cultural values. And the paper that I'm working on now, I'm not sure if you'll ever need it, but just um, as a brief um, introduction. So uh, even though Hofstadter's instrument was bad and many other instruments were you know, devised or, or introduced, we kind of seem to be not happy with any of them quite yet. So we keep introducing new and new instruments for measuring culture. And so where we are at this time is that we have over hundred instruments and nobody really knows uh, what to do with them which one is the best, which one to use. And so if I go to my um, uh, collection of uh, feedback emails, so in, in response to my catalog, many people contacted me saying that, um, you know, saying thank you, but in many cases asking me for advice on the best instrument. So I don't know how many I have here, but if I look here, I have, as you can, can see quite a few people, most of them emailing me and saying, so now you've like over hundred emails, now that you've analyzed all of them. So which one would you recommend? And so I didn't know what to say. And I thought, well, why don't I evaluate at least the most popular and try to figure out which one is the best. And so that's precisely what I did. In this X culture um, uh, project of mine, what I did was, um, uh, so I identified six instruments that have been specifically developed to replace Hofstadter's instrument, like Dorfman and Howell, the one that I showed you, uh, or U is another one. And so, and then I took the original Hofstadter's instrument and then I asked about a thousand people to complete each of those instruments. And then I evaluated the quality of each instrument in terms of the content validity, reliability, uh, factor structure, uh, measure invariance, like if men versus women take the instrument, you get different results or different factors. If young versus old or experienced versus inexperienced take the test, do you see any difference? And so basically based on that, I was trying to see if there is much difference. And to my dismay, most of the instruments were actually not that good. So Dorfman and Howell was not bad. Uh, so here, just as one of the uh, examples, for example, Condex Alphas, right? Anyone remembers what Condex Alpha needs to be? What's the acceptable level? Anyone? Have you ever taken statistics? We usually wanna see the larger, the better, but 0.7 is the absolute minimum. And uh, usually below 0.7, we say that's bad. 
but usually we want to see a little bit more. And so when you look at Hofstadter's original instrument, that reliabilities are like 0.18. I mean, this is, this is not even unacceptable. This is like lower than chance. I mean, this is extremely bad. So for a couple of dimensions, it's kind of approaching 0.7, but none of them is even within the acceptable range. So U was not bad. So all of them are above the cutoff and then Dorfman and Howell was not bad. And then we actually developed one of our own. So using all of the knowledge we've gathered by analyzing those instruments, and so ours turned out to be actually better on, you know, among the best on, on all the tests. But anyway, here you can look at the results and you can see which one is sort of better. And more importantly, how you would do to evaluate these instruments. Like for example, here we looked at the factor structure. And so we provided the number of uh, factors that seem to uh, be where, you know, where they expected to be. And so, or loadings, so to speak. And so again, half that is the average loadings are not even within the range. And so like all kinds of problems that we see. And so here we have percentage of items that load as expected. So in Hofstadter's instrument, less than half load as expected. But then again, we have several instruments that are pretty good. So, um, uh, and again, but anyway, uh, so the point here is that we sort of know how to measure cultural values, but uh, at least the original study was not very good and multiple attempts have been made to improve it. But again, not all of them were successful. Now, if I have to summarize the biggest sense of how we measure cultural values, and one of the readings in your um, catalog here is a paper called um, 10 Cents of, uh, of Cross-Cultural Studies, I believe. Um, just a second. Uh, I think I put it on the optional uh, readings list, but um, you have here one of the studies that is, um, uh, did I not include that? Maybe I should, but there is a paper called uh, Challenging the 10 Myths of Cross-Cultural Research. And so they include things like, for example, one, uh, culture is values. So as Erica said, um, culture uh, has been, uh, you know, is more than values. Culture is also artifacts, culture is also traditions, culture is also um, tradi uh, to, um, uh, um, I don't know, heroes and so on and so on. But when you look at research on cross-cultural differences, almost 100% of those studies look specifically at values, usually using either, either Hofstadter's instrument or something like that. And so we basically kind of condensed culture to values and ignore everything else. Then the opposite is true. We also believe that the values are inherently cultural. And so people have been coming up with all kinds of values, but just about anything they would say, well, it must be cultural. I would argue that some of them may not be cultural, like maybe preference to work alone versus preference to work in teams. I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that it's more a personality issue than a culture per se. At least everywhere I've taught, everybody hates teamwork. So students always prefer to work alone. And uh, so it doesn't seem to be a cultural per se, just some people like it, some people don't. In any case, I would argue that at least not all of the values are cultural, right? Second, uh, self-reported uh, questionnaires or self-report questionnaires are suitable to measuring cultural values. As I said, people may provide either uh, you know, uh, socially desirable answers or may not read questions carefully or may give you completely random answers because they don't have time. So all kinds of things can go wrong. And so there are seven other things or eight more things in the paper that we discussed that you know, basically these things are sort of you know, a myth. Like for example, another myth is that cultures are very stable. And so basically they change, I believe Hofstede said that in a matter of centuries. So he said, I do not expect the relative rankings of countries to change any time uh, within the next century. Yet when you look at, for example, the changing culture within some cities, like for example, China, major cities, or India, major cities, I mean, it's very different from where they were you know, 20 years ago. In fact, if you take uh, you know, today's Shanghai versus 30 years Shanghai, today's Shanghai is probably much more culturally similar to the United States than, uh, you know, than to some other cities in China. Likewise, you know, talking about national cultures sort of makes no sense to me. In fact, one of the papers again on your list is uh, where we analyze if, if country is a good container for culture. Because when we say cu culture, we say like American culture or, or German culture or Japanese culture. But again, if we talk about cultures in terms of individual and collectivism, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, I argue, no, nationality is a very bad container for culture. First of all, within the United States, you will see a lot of different cultures. Take a lawyer from Manhattan and a farmer from Nebraska. I mean, they will be probably more different than a lawyer from Manhattan and a lawyer from Shanghai. I mean, they are, even though both of them are American. Uh, or even take one skyscraper in Manhattan and look at the values of the corporate, you know, elites on the top floor versus the guys in the mailroom. 
So uh, one geography, I mean, it's as close as it gets, but you will probably see very different cultural values. But then take, for example, again, those corporate you know, uh, executives in Germany versus the United States, probably they will be both equally individualistic, maybe low power distance oriented, maybe fine with uncertainty and things like that. And take those mailroom guys, they will be probably more alike for the countries. So in our analysis, we looked at all kinds of other potential containers. And so we found that it's much more appropriate, or at least mathematically, you see more similarities within the groups and fewer, I mean, more similarities between the groups and uh, fewer, fewer similar, similarities within the groups when you talk about cultures of, and here I'll pause, what are your thoughts about that? So what kind of sort of groups or segments of populations would be more meaningful, would lead to more homogeneous cultural clusters than nationalities? So if you have an option to compare people's you know, nationality written in their passport versus other characteristics, what would be those other characteristics that you think will produce cleaner clusters of cultural values? Any thoughts? Well, I mean, you look at like the United States, for example, and you can say that there's certain things like the, you know, American work ethic that are pretty generalized across the culture. However, um, there's a lot of values that differ regionally within the country too, because of the size that we have. So you're saying and geographic regions? I, I, to a degree, like, I mean, you could say that there, I mean, you could even just say like rural versus urban, it, it, there's a huge oh, cult that, that, cultural that difference. One, that one is a very good one. Yes, exactly. Rural versus urban, you always see the same difference in any country. So it has nothing to do with the United States, but you usually see differences in any country, urban versus rural, you know, rural um, uh, populations. That's a very good one. Regional, many people thought like, you know, regional, not rural, um, not, not in terms of, you know, city of uh, town, but looking at, uh, you know, different regions of the country. Like for example, the Globe study looked separately at Canadian Anglophones versus Canadian Francophones, basically Quebec versus the rest of Canada. Or they looked at Switzerland and they had the Italian, the German and the French quarters, right? So, but then again, other studies show that no, that separation is again, not the best one. So rural, urban, that's a very good one. Uh, so, and basically again, globally. So uh, there will be more similarities among, you know, city dwellers around the world than uh, between, for example, city and uh, town people within any given country, including the United States. Anything else? Christine, you, you, you had some, something? Go ahead, yeah. Something's with your driver sound. <laughs> it makes the sound, you know, like chipmunk. Let's uh, try now, how about now? Now it works, yes. Okay, occupation. Yeah. What about occupation? Like yes, different that's jobs. a very good one. That's a very good one. Same thing. So our results show that um, the culture of profession is much more informative than the nationality. So, and the related one is uh, socioeconomic status and level of education. So basically, let's say if you look at, you know, business people or lawyers or farmers for that matter around the world, they will be much more similar than, you know, different professions within the same country. People, uh, so we also talked about socioeconomic classes, kind of culture, the culture of the rich versus the culture of the poor. So everywhere in the world, poor people tend to be more collectivist, so to speak, uh, more power distance oriented and rich people tend to be, perhaps, you know, your money sort of allows you to be a little bit, you know, a little bit less maybe respective, uh, respectful of your bosses and things like that. So nationality is not a very good container, you know, to, you know, to begin with, uh, even before we get into the details. But anyway, you have some re readings there that talk about these things in more detail. They provide you the number, the statistics, and so that's what we, you know, basically what we need to know about culture and culture measurements. Now let's talk a little bit about the derivatives of culture. So um, when we talk about different countries, we talk about cultural, uh, I mean, sorry, when we talk about culture, we often talk about cultural change. And so here again, you have a few studies that talk about why cultures change and how they change. So we have uh, several papers, uh, like for example, the World Value Survey, you may have heard about it. And so Inglehart talks about uh, a massive cultural change on all kinds of dimensions. Uh, Ralston was looking specifically at China and some other countries and found that some values converge around the world. So the world is becoming more individualist in general. Some values can uh, um, um, uh, diverge, the world becomes less different and some values crossverge. So they kind of go not towards the American values but crossverge in the middle. And so uh, I also published one paper where we talked about um, sort of improving cultural uh, indices. 
So one of the problems with Hofstadter's work is not only that there are some flaws in the measurement, but also the sheer age of the, of the work. So the book was published in 1980, but the data were collected in 1967-73. And so by now it's literally half a century old data. And so that means that uh, even if in 1967, there was such a difference between let's say the United States and Germany, or maybe the United States and Vietnam, it may not necessarily be true today. And so what we tried to do in this study was um, we tried to kind of model the change of culture over time. And so what we did is we produced the scores for all of those dimensions like power distance, but we calculated a separate score for the 1980s and then 90s and then 2000s. And then the plan was to do it also for the 210s and 220s, but I never got to that, but we used a meta-analytic approach. Uh, doesn't really matter the methodology, we'll talk about that later. But one of the ways we wanted to address that problem with the cultural sort of, you know, indices becoming old by introducing new indices for each decade. And so we found a bunch of interesting challenges and ch changes over time. Let me see, I think we had the graphs here. So like, for example, when you look at power distance over time. So the United States is less power distance oriented today than it was uh, in the 70s. So uh, Americans think even less about their bosses than 40 years ago. But for example, South America in general was very high power distance oriented and now it's much less power distance oriented even to the point that it may be less power distance oriented than the United States, right? Or the same thing, for example, when you look at individualism. So the United States is a little bit less individualist today than it was before. I guess you know, some liberal values perhaps a little bit more prevalent, but again, South America uh, is much more Individualism, individualist today than it used to be. And it's not quite where the United States is, but sort of getting there. And so uh, there are definitely some changes over time. So again, what was 50 years ago may not necessarily be uh, anymore. And so Hofstadter's book originally was called Culture's Consequences. And the focus was on, uh, you know, how culture predicts all kinds of things. Uh, did I include a, uh, oh no, that's just a word version of the paper. So Hofstadter talked about it as culture is the cause and everything else is the effect. And so in this paper, we approached it differently. So we talked about culture as a consequence. So we wanted to know other things that shape culture. And so specifically here, we looked at all kinds of factors that predict cultural values. And as those factors change, does culture change as well? And sure enough, we found, as I said, as people become more educated or if they start making more money, either at the individual level or as a society, uh, or if people experience more political freedom, economic freedom, their values change. And so we argued that it may be the environment that shapes culture and not the other way around, although more, more likely than not, there is kind of like a two-way street. But yes, culture is not always the cause, it could also be a consequence. All right, so now an interesting question is uh, acculturation. So cultural change that's at the national level. When you look at the individual level, so again, we see that cultures uh, change over time. And so uh, again, as people get older, cultures change, as people move to different uh, countries, cultures change and things like that. And so there are two things here that I would like you to sort of uh, note. One, um, my hobby is collecting instruments. And so another catalog that I um, saved here for you is the catalog of instruments for measuring acculturation. And so I don't know how many I have, I have 63 instruments. And so as you will see, people measure acculturation differently from cultural change. So they look, for example, at changes in your proficiency of English. In this case, apparently it's designed you know, to measure acculturation of people who move to the United States. Uh, so they look at proficiency in English versus proficiency in the language of origin. They look at things like, for example, uh, people you hang out with, food you eat, movies you like, uh, neighbors you, you live nearby. And so presumably that signals how Americanized you are. Like for example, I've lived between Canada and the United States for a little over 20 years now. And so if I used that scale, my acculturation is so-so. Um, so I'd like to believe that I learned English. My neighbors are all American. Uh, I still don't really like American food that much, but I'm not even sure what that is. Like American food, what is it? I, I don't really know. Uh, personal friends are primarily local. So I guess, yeah. But for example, some American staples like you know American football or baseball, like I don't get those things. Like I don't understand the rules. I don't understand how you can watch it. I mean, there's like three seconds of action and then 20 minutes of commercials. Like some of these things, like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I will ever, you know, 
understand those games. So some things apparently never change and others maybe change a little bit faster. And so uh, I don't know how many of you know that the Euro Cup is going on right now. Yeah, so at least we have one. So yeah, that's a big deal for me. So even though I haven't been in Europe for half of my life, I know that Ukraine won, yeah. So Ukraine is now in quarterfinals for the first time in, uh, yeah. And you know, who would care that there are 11 dudes, not even all of them born in Ukraine, that they, you know, scored two goals today against Sweden. Like, why would I care? But somehow I do. And so, and at the same time, I don't even know who won that. What is it that, that not the Stanley Cup, that's hockey. Uh, what's the cup for the American football? This is super, super Bowl, right? Like, I don't even know who plays in that. Is it universities or is it, is it states or is it cities? Like, <laughs> so obviously something's, you know, slow, slow change. But anyway, a lot of studies of that kind. And so one of the papers assigned to you there um, as an option for my dissertation, I actually wanted to know how quickly people change their cultural values. So for my dissertation, I had a sample of about 2000 people and um, I looked at how long they lived in Canada. So I had seven major immigrant groups in Canada. So I had Chinese, I had Indians, I had uh, Pakistanis, uh, I had, uh, there were some Europeans, uh, Ukrainians is a big uh, community in Calgary where I collected my data. So there were seven national groups and I wanted to see how long it is before they sort of fully Canadianized. And so um, uh, what I did was I asked them, how long have you lived in Canada? And then I measured their cultural values uh, uh, approach. And then I had a sample of Canadians as a control group. And then I wanted to see if those who lived in Canada longer, if they score more closer to, to kind of the Canadian uh, control sample. And uh, so what I found was that yes, people acculturate, but very slowly. So even those who have lived in Canada for like 20 years and they had a few of those, there were still de detectable differences. But uh, there were a bunch of factors that would speed up or slow down that process. Like for example, age at immigration, or did you get education in Canada or not? The biggest predictor was how, what percentage of your friends are Canadians versus people from your own country. And what was interesting when I found that, uh, so what I found was that people among whose friends fewer than 15% uh, were Canadians, they actually did not acculturate, but they sort of showed negative acculturation. So over time, they became even more like their native country and even more different from Canadians. So basically, if you live in Canada, but you never hang out with Canadians and it was just conducted in Canada, then over time, you sort of show affirmation of your original values rather than acculturation. So I guess tells you, you know, when you have those sort of, you know, ethnic sort of quarters within cities, then, you know, people seem to, you know, so kind of grow in the opposite direction. But in any case, so even after 20 years, it seems like there are still some differences. The only difference was that people from some countries, women, not people in general, but women from some cultures, uh, so quickly became um, sort of in terms of gender egalitarianism, so quickly became basically feminist that they scored, many of them scored more feminist than Canadian women. So they basically, they, 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 they overshoot as we call it. And so it seems like, you know, once you relocate, you, you sometimes like some value so much that you kind of take it even beyond what the native population does. But anyway, so if you ever need to look at cultural change, then you have a few sample studies there and a few fundamental studies that talk about it. Now, an interesting uh, topic is cultural distance, right? So ultimately you would like to know the difference, uh, you know, like what is the difference between the two countries? And so here the first study, probably fundamental study on this topic is uh, Kogut and Singh. So what they did was they took the average across all dimensions and calculated the average for different countries. And then they took the average of those individual averages and basically calculated a distance between each country. And so this way, for example, let's say if China is, I don't know, 45 on individualism and the United States is 91, that gives you a gap of about uh, 40 points, right? But then, you know, let's say the gap is uh, 30 points on masculinity, 28 points on internal avoidance, and maybe 60 points on um, uh, what's less than power distance. And so you take the average and then you see the distance is let's say 45 on average. And so in this specific paper, they looked at the choice of entry modes. So if an American company tries to establish a I mean, tries to establish business uh, in a different country, will they choose a safe mode, like simply shipping the products without any presence in that market? Or would they try to open a wholly owned subsidiary, subsidiary or will they do some sort of a joint venture or something else? And so they found that the more cultural distance the more likely people will have some sort of a partnership with the local. And then the less the power distance, the more likely the company will take more risk and will go towards 
a wholly owned subsidiary. So if you go, for example, from the United States to Canada, you probably know enough about Canada, so you don't really need a local partner. You can have a wholly owned subsidiary there in Canada. But if you go to China, well, you know, too many differences, too, too, too risky. Maybe let's just form a joint venture or some form of an alliance. Now, what's interesting here is that uh, that seems like a very simple approach, but some people came up with sort of different, um, different views on it. Like, for example, some people talk about uh, so-called cultural uh, overlap instead of cultural distance. So if you take um, two countries, um, uh, so, and you have a distribution, for example, like this for the United States, right? And so the average would be whatever that is, let's say 91. And then you take another culture, obviously the distribution is not just the average, it's something, something else, 54, for example. So when you look at this, it seems like there is a difference here. But uh, so Maceland and Van Horn, so one of the papers there, they said, well, we shouldn't worry too much about the distance between these two points. What we should worry more about the percentage of these distributions overlapping. Because what that tells us that even though there is a big difference in means, when you look at the distributions, you can easily see that it's probably about 60% overlap. So which, which means, you know, if you take a random person from Germany, there is a substantial chance that that person will be more like a random person from the United States. And so they looked at the sort of width of the distribution and calculated so-called cultural overlap instead of cultural distance, right? And so another sort of notion here is also so-called cultural friction. And that relates to directionality. So people were arguing or some scholars were arguing that yes, the more cultural distance, the more difficult it is to adapt. But the direction of movement matters. Like for example, they were arguing that when an American moves to Japan, versus when a Japanese moves to the United States, which one do you think will have more, you know, like will be, will, will find it harder to adapt and assimilate and acculturate? So would a Japanese in the United States experience more difficulties or an American in Japan? By adjustment, do you mean their personal acculturation or do you mean their acceptance within let's say you're sending Let's say you're sending an expatriate to a different country. And so we know that not, not all expatriates succeed at their assignments. So some have a hard time, basically have a culture shock, shock. Some have a difficult time adapting to the new culture. So they have constant stress. Uh, some of them are never accepted by the locals uh, and some of them simply return prematurely. So let's call it expatriate failure. So if you're not able to cope and you know after three months or four months, you start whining and saying, I wanna go home. So of the two, an American in, China, in, in Japan and a Japanese in America, which one has a harder time adjusting and has a higher chance of basically saying, no, I can't, I can't, I, I need to go home. I'm gonna say the American in Japan, it would have a harder time. And that's precisely what they found. So they talk about it as if, you know, like a truck going uphill versus downhill. The distance may be the same, but going uphill is much more energy, you know, demanding than going downhill. And so they talk about culturally loose and culturally tight societies. So they say, if you go to a culturally tight society, that, then it's more difficult. So Japan has you know, a lot of norms and things that don't turn away. And so American habits perhaps will be you know, perceived they're almost, uh, you know, some of them almost savage. So a Japanese person coming to the United States that, that is a much more culturally loose society, even if the Japanese person keeps doing things the way you know, he or she did it in Japan, most people probably wouldn't care. So if you're a little bit more polite than the average, if you're a little bit more tidy, if you never you know, throw a piece of paper on the ground, uh, people will probably appreciate it and definitely not judge it. But the other way around, that would be a big deal. Like for example, did you know that in the whole city of Tokyo, there is not a single trash can? So th they expect you to bring your trash home. Like if you buy a bottle of Coca-Cola, you will have to bring that bottle home because yeah, they just don't have trash cans in the city, that's it. So, I mean, for Americans, that would be very inconvenient. For the Japanese, well, there are trash cans, well, even better. So obviously, again, so the, the distance matters, but the direction in which you're moving probably matters a lot as well. Finally, cultural intelligence. That's an interesting topic, and we are almost done with the paper called 50 Years of Measuring Cultural Intelligence. So um, if, if it's done by the end of the semester, which it might be, I'll, I'll share that with you. But if not, there are enough papers here, and again, some instruments uh, of cultural intelligence like N at all, uh, or actually one that we developed, but we also talked a little bit about other things related to uh, cultural differences, cultural intelligence, one of the instruments that, uh, that for example, um, I developed with my colleagues and so on. 
And uh, actually, I do have oh, uh, I do have a um, um, working version of the paper. So half a century of measuring cultural values. Sorry, this one is an older one, but it's not published yet. So you'll have a working version. But anyway, question for you guys: How would you define cultural intelligence? So now that you know what culture is, what is cultural intelligence? So you know the general intelligence, right? You know IQ. Anyone knows what IQ is? Can you define IQ or general intelligence? General cognitive ability, I believe is the official name. Anyone? So there are different theories of, of intelligence, but uh, when we talk about IQ, so, so to speak, so there are two different ones. One believes that IQ is a combination of different things. So, and those things are independent. Like you can have a good memory, but perhaps not be very good at spatial orientation. Uh, or you can be good at math, but not good at uh, reading, for example. And the theory of general cognitive ability believes that there is this you know, X factor, G factor, actually, they call it. And they say, well, if you're smart, you are smart in everything. So there is something special in your head that makes you smart in everything. And so if you're smart in one area, you're probably smart in other areas. But in any case, both of those theories, they talk about IQ as a combination of different skills or competencies. And those include, as I said, like memory, spatial orientation, uh, logic, and so on and so on. And you probably have taken IQ tests. I'm not sure, have ever anyone ever taken an IQ test? Okay, well, you know what IQ is. Then there is the thing called emotional intelligence. So uh, presumably our ability to read emotions of others and control our own emotions. So the big two components, one, you look at a person and you know how they feel, and two, uh, you know what to do about it, but then also you can control your emotions as well. Uh, and then there is cultural intelligence. So how would you define cultural intelligence? Anyone? I remember the four buckets of oh, yeah, some yeah. of them. Yeah. So yeah I think it was metacognitive, cognitive, motivation, and behavioral were the four yeah. that were. Precisely, yes, that's that's yes. all model. So there are several models, but yeah. So basically the definition is that um, the cultural intelligence or cultural intelligence is your ability to function effectively in cross-cultural environment. And so to do that, you need to have those four competencies. One of them is cognitive. So knowing, knowing different cultures. So you know a lot about other cultures. The other one is metacognitive. So you sort of think about how you think about it. So when I talk to you, when I notice something, I kind of make a mental note, oh, okay, that's how they talk or okay, that's how they treat one another. Behavioral, that's your adaptation. So I noticed that you maybe talk slower or maybe uh, you, you, you eat different food. And so I kind of adapt, adapt my behavior to be a little bit more suitable. Doesn't necessarily mean that I try to assimilate, but I adjust my, for example, speech rate or my vocabulary to make it a little bit more suitable for this conversation. And then finally, motivational. In fact, that should have been the first one, my interest in, you know, in, in interacting with people from different cultures. So uh, hanging out with people from different cultures and so on and so on. Um, how would you measure that though? Like how would you measure, for example, let's say motivational, behavioral, uh, uh, cognitive? Um, so what would be, again, you need to put that in numbers, right? So you know what an IQ test look like, looks like. You have, uh, for example, you know, finish the, uh, finish the sequence, you know, one, two, four, eight. What's the next number? 16, presumably, right? So uh, you either know the answer or you don't. So how would you measure CQ then, cultural intelligence? A very difficult task, by the way. A series of items just like you have with measuring culture. Um, so maybe one of them could be um, something about enjoying working with people from a different cultural background. That's a very, very good point. Precisely what's done. So for the motivational CQ, that component, the question literally would be how much do you enjoy working with people from different cultures? Or how much do you like trying new food? And so presumably if you like it, your motivation is high, so that's high. How about cognitive? How would you measure the cognitive, um, uh, so knowledge about other cultures? Let, let, let Experience. Me um, that's an interesting one. So although again, you can spend a lot of time in some country as a tourist and still not have you know, much experience perhaps. Uh, there is this joke, uh, I'm not sure if it's appropriate, but I'll, uh, I'll tell you, I guess. Uh, so, um, you know, the, 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 the nature of your visit to the country determines how much you learn. 
And so uh, the joke goes like this, um, a guy dies and goes to paradise. And uh, he spends some time in paradise and kind of likes it. So, you know, uh, all day angels are reading you uh, newspapers or literature, uh, classic music is playing. And so everything is nice and quiet and peaceful. And then after about a year in paradise, he decides to take a vacation and so buys a ticket to hell. So he comes to hell and like, whoa, that's like a rave party. So everybody's dancing, everybody's drinking. Uh, so everybody's having a good time. He's like, oh, that's interesting. So he goes uh, back to, to, to paradise and applies uh, for the immigrant visa. And so the God looks at his application and says approved and gives him the green card or the passport to hell. And so the guy packs his bags and goes to hell. And once he crosses the border, the devil puts him on the frying pan and starts frying him on the fire. And he says, what's going on? I was here as a tourist the last week and it was so good. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm you know, in, a, in a pot being boiled. And the devil says, well, do not confuse tourism with immigration. So as a tourist, you know, it's a lot of fun and you, know, you basically have fun, but once you relocate permanently, you have to deal with things like you know, the driver's license, the water bill, the whatever else, school for your kids. And so it becomes much, much more challenging. And so as an immigrant, you learn definitely much more than as an occasional tourist. So definitely a much, much different experience. In fact, I bet many people who go to Mexico every year you know, for, to vacation, they probably still have very little understanding of their, for example, Mexican institutions and whatever else you know, they have to deal with there. So same thing here. But in any case, um, let's talk again about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we talked about the good. And so let me talk a little bit about the ugly stuff. And uh, so in fact, one of the papers here, I believe is uh, my recent work about the persistent questions with measuring cultural intelligence. But uh, let me open the most popular instrument. So about 80% of all studies that measured cultural intelligence, they used this instrument here and it all. And so somewhere at the end here, you have the actual items. And so the knowledge of cultural, uh, of the not, so the motivational ones are just like uh, Leah said, uh, so the, the questions would be uh, motivational. I enjoyed interacting with people from different cultures. But for example, cognitive, so the knowledge, uh, you know, the question is literally, uh, to what extent do you agree with the statement? I know the legal and economic systems of other cultures. The scale is one to five. How would you answer this question? If I asked you this question, what would you say? How well do you know legal cultures and systems, economic systems of different countries? What would you give? What would be your number? Out of five, maybe like a three, because you know some of them better than others. All right, so three, anyone else? I would probably give myself a two. There's many, many different cultures that I am, I know nothing about. All right, anyone else? Um, do you see any problem with this question? Any problems? It's two questions. To me. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, maybe I know a lot about legal, but not economic systems. Any other what, problems? What, what exactly consists of, like, how do you define knowing? Like, do you need to just have awareness of it? Or do you need to, like, have a true deep understanding of it? Or Yeah, yeah. so, like, for example, the biggest problem I see is, um, one, open to manipulation. I would give myself five. Not because I know, but because why not? I definitely know what you want to hear. Like if I'm applying for a job and cultural intelligence is one of the tests, I would give myself five on everything. So uh, I know what the answer should be like. In fact, who would give a correct, you know, an honest answer? Second, if I wanted to evaluate myself, as somebody said, yeah, I don't even know what that means. Like I can give myself anything between two and five. Like I could give myself a five because I, I've been to many countries, I teach this stuff. So I, I think I know more than most, but then I also know, you know, like the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? The, the more you know, the more you know, the more you know, the more you know how little you know. And so people who know nothing, they, they have a very high confidence because they think they know everything. You know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So it looks like this. So um, let me just, uh, if, if you don't, so, that's your vertical scale is your um, uh, confidence and the horizontal scale is your knowledge. And so when you have very little knowledge, you tend to have very strong confidence in your knowledge because you don't know how little you know. And then when you start learning stuff like, whoa, okay, there is much more to it than I thought. So your confidence goes down and only when you become a true expert, your confidence goes back up. So when I ask a question like this of somebody who's never been overseas, they would think, oh, yeah, I think I know I've seen a few movies about those different countries. I forgot what they're called, but yeah, I guess I know enough. 
And so in my case, I've studied this for a long time and I know how little I know. So I would justify anything between definitely three, four and five and maybe even two, because again, many things I just don't know. And then, so um, another problem also is that, um, again, some of these things may not necessarily be related. Like for again, I may know a lot about, for example, uh, uh, other languages, but not necessarily about legal and economic systems or the other way around. So, uh, you know, very open to manipulation. This question here, if I were to use this approach to IQ tests, then I would not be asking you what is two plus two, right? So, you know, no, no IQ test asks you what two plus two is, but the question still would look something like this. So you would be given a question and then you either know the answer or you don't. With the CQ, what we do is we say, on a scale from one to five, how well do you think you know the answer to this question, right? So that's absurd. I mean, how well do you think you know the answer to this question? So one of the, for example, refinements we made in our test, so we, we developed a test called DCIQ, then at least for cultural knowledge, we have a list of questions that are either correct or incorrect. Like for example, you tip uh, cab drivers in Japan, true or false? Anyone knows, do you tip cab drivers in Japan or not? No, you don't. So uh, in fact, once I tried and somebody caught me literally like a block away and gave me the money back. So Japanese don't tip. So I don't know why. Or for example, uh, four is a lucky number in China. True or false? False. Anyone? No, it's an unlucky number. In fact, uh, most of the skyscrapers in China and Japan don't have uh, the fourth floor, just like many high sc skyscrapers in the United States don't have a, um, uh, a 13th floor, right? And so same thing here. So uh, you either know or you don't, but then for motivational, again, we didn't figure out how to fix it because you know it becomes a little bit problematic here. So one thing I've done is um, uh, I've developed an instrument and again, we'll be presenting it tomorrow at the Academy of International Business that I call quasi observational scale of cultural intelligence. And so it still can be manipulated, but um, it's designed to not give you abstract questions like you know how much do you pay attention to to cues of, you know when you visit a different country but rather it starts with the question what was the last country you visited how long did you spend there what was the purpose of your visit and then if you've never been overseas uh what are the nationalities of people from different countries that you meet in your country how often do you talk to them uh what they do kind of to prime you and then all of the questions are very similar to what the questions are in an at all questionnaire but it always says so from your last trip to that country like for example, if you had to describe the culture of that country, how much can you say? And your answers would be, well, maybe one or two lines of text or maybe half a page or maybe one page, or I can write a whole book. Or for example, instead of asking how much interest do you have in hanging out with locals, the question asks on your trip to that country, how many locals did you talk to? And so, and then you literally provide zero. I never had the time all the way to more than 10. And so that actually asks you to recall the actual behaviors or attitudes and experiences and then quantify them. At least that gives you a little bit more sort of objective measure, even though you can still lie. But if you want to do self-assessment, the answers become a little bit more obvious. So instead of trying to guess where you stand on a one to five, you actually provide the exact frequency or the exact duration. And so that hopefully gives us a little bit more valid uh, measure. Um, so I think this is all. Let me check if I didn't miss anything on the reading list, but... Um, so um, I think that would be pretty much everything that I needed to talk about today in general terms. So we talked a little bit about culture's consequences. We talked about how culture is measured. Uh, we talked about cultural change and you have a bunch of studies here. And again, some of them are sort of, you know, you definitely need to read them if you wanna learn more. Others are sort of, you know, nice to have, but not necessarily cultural distance and cultural intelligence. Yeah, so I think I covered pretty much all of the important ones and, um, uh, so uh, now the questions that you may have. Any questions, comments, observations? So there was a I lot of- I have one back. Go ahead. <laughs> you can go first. Go ahead, Erica. Okay. Um, back on the cultural IQ, um, would it make sense to, in the design of who's asking the questions, to not ask the person um, to get more objectivity to say, okay, um, you know, your five peers that you travel with are going to measure you on cultural IQ. I mean, it, would that is that an approach that could get to more objectivity and more accuracy? This is a very, 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 very good question. And in fact, that's precisely what we did in Exculture. So 
uh, we didn't say, how, I, I like your idea of if somebody had to rate you, what would they say? What we did was we literally had uh, the team members to rate each other. So just like those questions, you know, how much do you know about other cultures? How motivated are you, you know, to hang out with people? It was, you know, so uh, how would you rate Theresa on this one? Uh, you know, would you, you know, where does she fall? And so we found that the correlation is actually relatively low. So what people or how people evaluate your cultural intelligence versus your self-evaluation, there is a correlation, but it's not very high. Again, the problem is that we are not sure if that was because, you know, if I like you, I'll give you high scores on everything just because I like you and I want you to look good. Or do I really think that you know a lot about cultures and legal systems of other countries? But in any case, there was a uh, significant difference in self versus peer evaluations. But well, maybe that's because the correlation doesn't exist, right? I mean, if you're if you're correlating a, 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 another person's rating against something that isn't accurate, there's never going to be a correlation, right? Yeah, I, but, but I really like your idea again for self-assessment and maybe to be more objective. You know, if, if your friends and family, you know, had to evaluate you, what do you think they would say? Or if your coworkers, so that again provides you a little bit sort of, you know, um, um, not really an anchor, but maybe. Uh, you know, cold shower so that you're not too self-confident. So maybe, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think I know, but if I ask my people, maybe they would say, oh no, he makes mistakes all the time. So, right. I think I know everything there is to know about American culture, but when you guys kind of observe me, I'm like, oh, he has no clue. You know, that the 20 years here didn't help him at all. And so maybe, you know, maybe your assessment will be more objective. Yeah. So that's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Um, so as I said, when it comes to all those measures, we love the final results. And so when, uh, you know, we talk about research, we say, oh, scientists from this university have shown, but once you look at the specifics, we still know relatively little and that the instruments we use are still somewhat questionable. And so the problem is that just about every study in international business involves culture, cultural change, acculturation, cultural distance, uh, cultural intelligence. But the truth is that, um, you know, much of that is kind of garbage in, garbage out. So, uh, you know, it still seems to work. And we know that cultural intelligence, for example, predicts all kinds of outcomes. In fact, we recently published a meta-analysis and it's one of your readings there. So where we looked at how cultural intelligence predicts uh, like seven or eight different outcomes, work performance, expatriate intention, expatriate adjustment, things like that. And sure enough, there is a relatively strong significant correlation. So even with these crude instruments, we still get pretty good results and at least we can predict something. But we're still a long way from claiming that we got everything you know, measured. But the same thing, by the way, with, culture, uh, with IQ. So you remember that uh, about a hundred years ago when IQ became a thing. So there were all those big studies and you know, tra tracking you know, infants uh, into adulthood. There were all kinds of predictions, how it explains anything and predicts anything. And in reality, we know that often people with top IQ don't necessarily are more successful and vice versa. So we often see people with average IQ actually being pretty good. And so in fact, in many cases we see that, uh, like for example, I don't know how true it is, but I recently read um, The Virgin Way by uh, Richard Branson. And so he claims that his IQ is below average and he's dyslexic and all kinds of problems, but he seems to be pretty successful. So I don't know. Uh, not to mention that again, other factors may, may matter so much more, like your connections, your parents, your you know, uh, kind of uh, um, privilege in the society. So in many cases, that may be much much more predictive of success, even though IQ was you know expected to be that you know single best predictor of everything. So. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I um, I don't have anything <clears throat> anything else to add. So if you have any questions or observations, uh, now is the time. Um, one more quick question. So um, there was a lot of discussion in the first section about the globe project, and then there sounded like there was a lot of back and forth uh, between Hofstede and globe as to which was more, which was a better, uh, more effective tool. Um, so the globe study was in the early 2000s and it was really large scale. Have there been other large scale projects since then? Or I mean. Excellent question. I literally spent the whole day writing about it today. So, and uh, there was a session earlier today, there was a debate. So there were two speakers for and two against who literally were comparing the two approaches. But um, briefly about the GLOBE study. So originally started at the University of Calgary right around the time when I landed there. So they had the first original meeting there. So, and then shortly after they published the book. So, uh, but um, the idea was that we will use Hofstede as sort of net, uh, you know, framework, but we'll do a better instrument and collect more data. 
And so it's not finished. It's, it's, uh, it's gone through several waves of survey. I think they've had four now, but they continue collecting data. Exculture helped them a little bit with that. Uh, so uh, they have collaborators now in hundreds all around the world. And so they continue doing that over and over again so that they can track change over time. And so it's a bigger project. It's a uh, better instrument. It's more dimensions. But there are also still some problems. Like, for example, one of the arguments that was in, in 2008, I believe, there was a big uh, debate in the Journal of International Business Studies. It was uh, Hofstede's article about Globe, Globe's article about Hofstede, then rebuttal from each of them. And then Christopher Early was uh, sort of, you know, trying to reconcile the differences. I think his article was when elephants fight, uh, the grass get, gets crumbled or something like that. And he was saying that, guys, you're missing the big picture, trying to prove that your instrument is better. But one of the difference was, for example, that Hofstede looked at IBM employees. And people argued that IBM employees are not the best representatives of the general population. So uh, in Germany, maybe an IBM employee seems like an average citizen. But in Guatemala at that time, that was definitely not your average citizen. Uh, so the GLOBE study uses managers, or at least people with managerial experience, presumably sort of better you know, representation of the business world. In, in Hofstede's instrument, the questions are about you. So how important it is to you to have good working conditions. In GLOBE study, each question starts with, in this society, people tend to. So the questions are, you evaluate the society. Also, the GLOBE study differentiates between uh, uh, cultural values and cultural practices. And again, surprisingly, the correlation is negative. So you would think that values drive practices, but they found negative correlation. So it almost looks like you act co contrary to what you believe. And uh, one of the papers, I think I included that on your list, uh, we actually tried to explain why there could be negative correlations. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's more kind of mathematical artifact, or maybe it's people crave what they don't have. Like if you value something, you believe that people don't do enough of that. And so when you think, <clears throat> that let's say living close to your family is important. But when asked, do people in your country live close to their family? You say, oh, no, no. They... So basically your answers are so, sort of become mirror of one another, but not because there is no correlation, but because what you value, you always don't see enough of it. So something like that. So, but then, so Globe was probably the only other one that produced a nice list of 64 countries with all those uh, indices. There was also a guy, uh, not was, is a guy, um, uh, Fons Trompenars from the Netherlands, just like Hofstede. So he came up with his own instrument and uh, he has uh, seven dimensions, but it's a commercial instrument. So he has a uh, company called Trompenars and, and Associates. And so because it's a commercial instrument, they never revealed the full list of items. I did have a chance to look at some of them and uh, actually met with Trompenars a few times. In fact, one of the proudest days uh, in my life, uh, four years ago, I got an award, uh, like basically, you know, contribution to measuring culture, something like that. And Trump and ours was the one who gave me the plaque. So he was the guest speaker. And so, you know, it was quite impressive or emotional for me because I grew up reading his books and now here he was on the stage giving it to me. But in any case, he never gave the details about the instrument other than he provided rankings for some of the dimensions. And so uh, you can read his book, but it's still not sort of freely available other than some hints. And so uh, I'm not sure if because it's not as good as he wants it to be, and that's why he doesn't, you know, release it, or because it's it's a commercial instrument and you know, kind of um, copyrighted information. So I don't know. And then Schwartz, uh, Shalom Schwartz. Uh, so he came up with his own model, which is very popular. His instrument was described in the original publication in '92, but uh, even though he collected some data, he never published them for some reason. And so he sent me an Excel file with the data, so I had his national rankings. There are a few other people who have it, but it's never been in the public domain. So it's literally like an individual file that I have. And so I used it a few times, but I don't know, it's like extremely popular as a model, but we don't have a nice publication with the list of countries. And so for his study, he actually used teachers. So he's not a management scholar. He is some sort of like, he's a professor, but he's more in education. And so maybe that's why he used teachers, but um, his argument was the teachers shape the society and its values. And so teachers were the best in, uh, sample, but that's what he did. So those are probably the most known and then the rest, even if there is something that would be small. Oh, very, very important, extremely important is World Value Survey. So that one doesn't give you the country, national country rankings, but what it does, it gives you the raw data. And so they started also in 1994, I believe was the first wave. So they have a survey of like 200 questions, maybe even more, maybe like 250 questions. And so they ask anything and everything. 
uh, political values, social values, uh, business related stuff. And so they literally publish raw data. And so uh, there have been hundreds of papers published based on that data set. Uh, I published actually a couple as well. So like, for example, uh, with my colleagues, we came up with this, what we call social tolerance index, you know, how much the society tolerates immigrants, uh, LGBT, uh, people uh, of different generations. So there were like four different categories and we ranked nations based on those uh, indices, but the data we used was specifically from the world value survey. And they literally had questions like, for example, uh, how disturbing it would be for you if your neighbor were gay, for example. And so they had questions like that. And so we used a set of those questions to obtain national averages. Uh, and uh, so that one is a very good collection it doesn't have any formal dimensions. You can derive any dimensions you want. I've seen people find in that you know, large collection of questions, questions that kind of represent something similar to power distance, uncertainty avoidance, individualism, collectivism. So there are different questions from what Hofstede had, but, but you know, close enough to argue that you can use the world value survey to measure Hofstede's values. But each scholar would have a different set of questions. So it's not standardized. But if you need something like that for your dissertation, that may be a very good source freely available, they had been like six or seven sur wave surveys, I mean, survey waves, and you can use that um, download, you know, it's like it's free, you can get it like within minutes. So was that a one time? Uh, and if so, when was that one done? The world value survey? No, no, they do it continuously, I think officially every four years, but then there are, you know, sort of like sub waves, so like they have the subset of that is the European value survey. And so they do it more frequently. And then I don't know if they now do it like four, you know, like every four years where they just continuously collect the data and then just sort of average it and release it every four years. But yeah, that one is a big one. By the way, the guy Inglehart, um, uh, the father of that instrument uh, or, or survey died uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So like literally just, just recently. Hofstede died last year, he was like 97 actually. And by the way, Hofstede remained active till like literally last day. Uh, plus also one interesting thing, again, not related to culture, but something that shaped me to a large extent. So uh, since my dissertation was, uh, or research during that time was um, involved some meta-analysis. And so we were trying to measure how culture changed over time. Um, I was looking for papers that used Hofstadter's instrument. And so the final paper contained something like 870 instruments, I mean papers, uh, so the meta-analysis. But as I was looking for those papers, many of them, I would read about them, but I couldn't find full text. So I wouldn't see the data. And so um, I kind of built up the courage at one at some point. And I sent an email to Hofstede saying, maybe you have copies of those papers. And to my huge surprise, he responded within minutes. And then he actually hired someone in the Netherlands, like some teaching assistant. And so they, they copied a lot of dissertations and doctoral theses and papers and sent me a whole box of papers. And so, and then uh, following that meeting, uh, that, that incident, uh, so it must've been like 2004 or something like that, maybe five, six. So the conference was in, in Atlanta, in Georgia. And so Hofstede was at the conference. Uh, and so I was presenting my meta-analysis. And so he came to my presentation and then he invited me for lunch and we spent some time. And so he was surprisingly very approachable for, you know, like top, top one scholar in the field. So very, very, you know, unusual. And I didn't expect that. And so uh, as I was asking people for copies of their papers, one thing that I even wanted to write that as a separate paper, one thing that I found nearly a perfect correlation between your sort of stature or your number of citations and uh, how much time it takes for you to respond and how much text you write. So people, the more reputable are the scholars, the more likely they were to respond and the more detailed were their messages. Like Hofstadter wrote me pages. I don't know where he found the time. And then many people who published one paper, they ne never even responded or you know, would respond and say, I don't have time for that. So I'm not sure if that's because, you know, once you're at the top, you kind of feel the obligation to help the poor students, or maybe the way you got to the top was that you've always been so diligent and responsive, but there was a very, very strong correlation. And because I had all those emails, like, and I could count the number of words and the time it took them to reply, I thought I could re literally write a paper about that and somehow never got to it. So, but I uh, still have the data, so interesting, so. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's all I had to say. So um, if you have more questions, read the papers. And then um, if you don't read them now, not a big deal. Uh, but, you know, at least you have them in case you ever need to go back and you know, learn more when you do your studying. And yeah, next time we'll talk about uh, more advanced issues. So we'll move into kind of more micro management of people in cross-cultural settings. So it will be kind of international HR.
All right. Well, good night, and um, thank you for. Uh, mm -hmm. Are Are you? um divvying out the papers you want us to do for this week or how are you oh yes yeah, yes let's talk a little bit about that so um <clears throat> you have the assignment um in canvas and so all you need to do let me share and show you <clears throat> all you need to do is just write your three questions uh or three um potential topics for the uh for the study so you you all you need to do is literally three topics and i think i asked you to maybe a research question and a sample hypothesis, but it's literally just a few lines of text. And so what you'll do once you go to the assignment here, so um, uh, it will be in assignments here, uh, viable paper ideas. All you do is you just attach the paper. So when you go to the assignment, all you see, there will be one question attached file. I guess I, I cannot do the quick preview, but uh, it will be just drag and drop the file. And so you, you send those as a separate one page file, probably it will be half a page and that's all we need. So it's open until the end of the week and um, that's all you need to do. And then what I'll do next is that um, uh, rate the publishability. So once I have your ideas, I will create this survey. And so what I'll do is I will take each topic and create that as an item. And then you will be asked to evaluate each of those uh, topics in terms of how interesting you find it and how do you think publishable it is? You know, would people be interested in something like this reading like, or publishing it, something like this? And so once I'll have the data, I'll share them with you again, not for a grade, but only so you can see what the others think about your topic. You may think it's a brilliant idea that you know, will lead to a revolution in idea research, but maybe your colleagues will think different. Or maybe you have three questions and you don't know which one is the most promising. And so you can, again, you don't have to use those ratings to guide you, but hopefully it will be some sort of an indication of at least of the three that you have, which one will be most promising. So, but yeah, that's all you need to do, just three ideas for the next um, week, by the end of the week. Uh, any, any of you have any ideas that you're willing to share just, you know, as examples? Like, again, I will not be naming the name, so, uh, but you, you know who you are, right? So I spoke with one student and I thought that was a brilliant idea, probably publishable and very sort of hot at this time. So the person was talking about, um, um, over inclusion versus, I guess, under inclusion. So when people are invited to meetings, and so we always had a meeting overload, right? And uh, we always don't want to be excluded, and we want to be included. But if it's business meetings, at some point we have too many meetings, and everybody hates meetings. But it's gotten really bad with all these Zoom meetings. Like ever ever since the pandemic started, all of a sudden now everybody invites everybody to meetings. And so the student kind of, you know, the theory is that if people are included, sort of over included included in too many meetings, maybe meetings that they don't even feel they need to be there, then people will sort of behave differently during those meetings. They will be not as active, not participative and all kinds of, basically over inclusion is also bad. That's how I understood it. And so the idea was that culture can moderate it. So maybe this individualism, collectivism, you know, to some extent could be a factor. And again, going back to individualism, collectivism. So now you know that there are different measures of individualism, collectivism, and so it can be something from you know, my interest versus group interest, to preference to working teams versus alone, and things like that. So you need to know which one you choose because uh, they may be completely uh, independent and one may be more relevant than another. But also uh, at some point, maybe even some sort of a cross-cultural comparison. So uh, not only culture as a moderator, but maybe even national rankings on, I don't know, I'm not sure how far it can be pushed, but it seems like an interesting starting idea. So um, any other ideas that you are entertaining? I was going to be looking at some cultural aspects uh, across countries and how they affect uh, economic recovery of the workforce and like workforce participation coming out of COVID. That's a very interesting one. Also, very, very, you know, relevant. Do you know where you will get the data? Because that may be one of the challenges. Like, will you be looking at unemployment rates or what it be? That's what I was looking at. I was going to look at workforce participation, mm -hmm. unemployment rates, um, and other like broader, large um, economic metrics that most you know regions are are reporting regularly anyway. So yeah. that I could, yeah, and then very uh, very interesting, yeah. And especially if you look, yeah, you're right because unemployment may be a little bit misleading here, especially some nations. You know, governments give so much money out that people may not be looking for jobs, so may not be unemployed per se. But uh, labor force participation is a very good measure for this one. And yes, you can probably easily find, you know, what kind of policies the country uses, you know, uh, unemployment benefits, you know, rent forgiveness, whatever else. And so that's a very interesting one. Uh, vaccination rates. That's a very, very good study. If you do it fast, I think you can publish it in a top journal. Uh, many journals now specifically invite those kinds of articles. So that's a very interesting one. 
So basically some sort of like economic policies or political uh, decisions and how they affect the economic recovery. So that's a very good one. You can maybe even look at things like the stock market. Uh, I mean, it's not really an indicator of economic health, but still gives you something, maybe a consumer sentiment. So those kinds of things, that's a very good one. In fact, you're right, much of those data would be available. Like you have the vaccination rate, you have the uh, death rate, you have the economic indicators, and most of those do, you know, are released if not day by day, then at least month by month. So great, that, that's a very, very good idea, yeah. In fact, I love it so much. My worry is uh, that you're not the only one who will be analyzing this study. Uh, there was a book by, uh, what's this guy's name? Uh, CNN commentator, uh, Farad Zakaria, right? So he published a book, I just bought it yesterday, didn't read it yet, uh, The Lessons from the COVID Pandemic. And so he evaluates how different nations reacted and you know what were the consequences. And so part of it is also economic effect. The only problem with that book is that it came out in November and I assume was written you know, in the fall at least, maybe even summer fall. And so he was trying to draw the lessons a little bit too early in my opinion. So it would be now would be a better time and maybe even half a year from now. So, uh, but I will not be surprised that, you know, if, if many other people are looking at the same sort of question. So you better hurry because somebody will publish it first. So, but it's a very, very good idea. Anything else, any other? So I had this interesting thought coming from uh, a sort of a work situation um, and it's around M&A activity um, and, um, a phenomenon that might be driven by what I'm thinking is um, uncertainty avoidance. So the concept is this is, uh, you know, you know, big company flies in, acquires a smaller company, and, you know, you know, you, you give people financial bonuses for staying for a certain amount of time. And then it seems like this always happens. And then, you know, people skedaddle, they leave. Um, and and it's it seems like um, you know when we hear the reasons why, um, it it almost alludes to a sense of uncertainty with the firm that was being acquired. So I'm wondering if there's sort of a cultural element around uncertainty avoidance, and if that uncertainty avoidance is um, if they hot they they avoid it, so they want more stability. Maybe there's more turnover in high uncertainty avoidant cultures after M and A activity. So anyway, good. that was that's a very interesting topic. So Rika Sarala would be the person to talk to. She does specifically research on international mergers and acquisitions, and so including on how it affects then uh, retention of employees, because in many cases that leads to uh, a lot of attrition. Uh, another interesting kind of cultural twist here is that. Um, in some cultures, um, employees are sort of hired for a long time. Like in Japan, it's still life term, uh, lifelong employment. And so they tend to invest a lot of, in their employees or Germans for that matter too. So many people join company right out of high school and they receive education on the job. Whereas the American philosophy is that you go, go get your education elsewhere and come to us when you get your master's. And so we will not pay for your master's because we will pay for it and you'll take it to get a better job elsewhere. So here it's a complete separation, you know, job and, and, and work. I, I guess some companies do pay for, for additional education, but it's very uncommon, whereas in, in other countries, it's the, it's the only way. So uh, it's an in, very interesting. And then obviously, if you add the kind of layer of mergers and acquisitions to it, that's a, that's a very interesting one. Yeah, it's, it's a little complex. So from what I hear so far, it sounds to me like five different articles potentially, but that's good. So you can always select, you know, a narrow slice of that topic because you have so much going on here that it's it's almost like a topic for a career as opposed to for a quick paper for a course. But yeah, so definitely you can start developing the model. So since you don't need to do the analysis, at least the model seems like a very good, yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah. All right, okay, well then good night um, and uh, I'll see you in a week. What, one question before yes. we leave. Sorry, I, I don't think Karen's original question got answered. Which one? Uh, Karen, when she was asking about the assignments for this week, there's a second assignment uh, listed there that is a one page. Oh, yes, yes. So you have always two assignments. So one is um, uh, the, the paper, but the other one, so uh, you always have to select uh, one of the readings or one of the theories and then prepare a one page summary of uh, you know wh whichever one you chose. And uh, so that one is, yes, uh, you know, you can coordinate among yourselves to choose the ones, you know, so that two people don't do the same topic, but I don't mind if in the end it's two people doing the same topic, 
And so last time I showed you what those papers look like. Um, I don't know, maybe, you know what, maybe, for the, so last time we sort of agreed that it would be best that I show you what others did, but only after you submit your work. But maybe for the first week, maybe let, let me share with you what they did beforehand. So this way, at least you will know how to do the first one. And then from that point on, I will do it. I think that might be helpful, do you think? Or, or should we wait until Monday before I share this week's? Uh, let, let me do the preview here. I think I'll, I'll share with you, why not? Okay, Vaz, one of the questions was, um, and it seemed to be the direction that you were going to go with to just make sure that we did different papers than they yes. did last time. And, and that's so, another one. So for this one, at least, let me share with you the whole collection. So here you'll have what 18 papers prepared by 18 students, and that's on this topic culture. And so what you can do here then, I'm actually, yeah, I'm sharing my screen. What you can do is you can either take one of these and improve it. You can take one that they didn't cover, or you can do one and just do it completely differently. And so I'll share this with you so that you have the examples so that you can open one of them, see what it was you know, like. And uh, oh yeah, you even will see my comments here. So it looks like I even, and my apologies, sometimes I also correct the mistakes. Uh, like, you know, like if you miss a comma, misspell the word, I, I usually fix those, but not because I'm so picky. I, I make a lot of mistakes. It's just when I notice it, I figured, you know, uh, if you ever use it in the future, it's better to have that error corrected. Uh, so it's like five seconds of embarrassment, but then the life, you know, lifetime of, of no error, then I skip it. So therefore, you don't judge me too harsh if I make some of those corrections. But yeah, you will see the one pagers. You will see some of my comments. And uh, you can either then take one of the theories that they didn't cover and cover yourself, or you can take one of these and improve it, or you can just do it on, all on your own, whichever way you want. And so for this first one, uh, I will then share, let me actually put it in the comments so that you can copy it right as we speak. So this way I don't need to email it. But so in the chat, this is a direct link to the full collection for week one from the last semester. I will not do the same thing again in the future. Uh, I will release them after you submit your work. So this way both you will go through the exercise yourself, but then for your collection, you will have the stuff. And yes, I will also really start in next week then which topics have been covered so that you have, uh, you, you know, which ones have not been in case you want to do something new. Although we had 18 students last time and I think pretty much every time we covered all the topics and in some cases there were even some covered by multiple people just because we had so many students and you know, hardly ever do we have like a whole 18 theories in a given week. So therefore, um, as far as the overlaps, you pretty much can confidently assume that pretty much all the papers have been summarized last semester maybe like one or two skipped a couple of times, but most of the time it would be a full collection. So bottom line, we just make sure that all 10 of us, I don't even know how many of us there are, that we each pick a different paper. And as long as it's one of the culture papers, you're not concerned otherwise. Yes, uh, so first um, uh, you don't have to coordinate. You can select which one you like, but if you wanna coordinate, I guess that's a good idea. And second, yes, whatever readings have been assigned for this week, you can choose any one of those. And then for some of the topics, there will be not only readings, but there will be theories. And so there will be like for some, like for example, when we get to the resource-based view, so there will be like three papers on it. When we talk about, for example, cultural intelligence. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a theory, but there are like several papers that are introducing different instruments. And so you can take, for example, Anne et al and describe that particular instrument or you can maybe do a one page summary on cultural intelligence as a, as a theory in general, irrespective of a particular paper. So uh, it would be a one page summary, presumably, or preferably of a theory. In most of the cases, a theory equals one paper, but in some cases there may be slight deviation. It could be a theory described in multiple papers. I don't think we have any paper that describe, papers that describe multiple theories but it has to be sort of like a self-standing unit, either a paper or a theory, although in most of, most of the cases, that's the same thing. And so, yes, you look at the papers assigned for this week, you choose any one you like, you provide a one-page summary, and that's it. And so ideally, you probably wanna go with the papers with the asterisks, they're more important, but again, if you wanna take one of those either more sophisticated or more, you know, uh, like other papers or other theories, that's perfectly fine too. Like for example, when we talk about measures of cultural intelligence, I think I included several as an optional just because there are more available for cultural values. Uh, you have a paper, Hofstede is obviously, but you have you, you have Dorfman and Howell there. So you can just choose any one you like. 
although only one of them is assigned. So you don't need to read about all of the instruments. Okay, so yeah, one pagers, as I said, almost always people get full credit. I mean, you either have to do a very sloppy job or not do it at all. So I assume most of you will have no problem summarizing, you know, providing a good summary of the theory or a paper. But um, yeah, still don't take it lightly. So it still requires some sort of, you know, quality. Okay, all right, well, see you in a week then. Your assignments are due Sunday, and then I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Good night.